Dungeon Meshi, or Delicious in Dungeon, is a fantasy manga created, written, and illustrated by the amazing Ryoko Kui. When MC and I saw the Netflix adaptation, we were immediately hooked. The story is a simple premise of a destitute adventuring party delving deep into the island's most complex dungeon to rescue or revive the leader's younger sister. Seriously, it's the best D&D-like anime and belongs amongst the pantheon of modern fantasy titles like Freeren, Grimgar, ReZero, Don Machi, and of course, Konosuba. The series is a great example of simple done well, where the setting and characters are fairly straightforward on the surface but hide some complex narratives underneath. And Ryoko Kui's special sauce is, quite literally, sauce. <laughs> More specifically, Ryoko Kui uses food as a narrative vehicle to explore the characters' stories, the rich and interconnected ecology of the dungeon, and the cultural backdrop of its setting. And I want that. As a DM, I want my players to explore my setting through the history and ecology of food. I want my players to really think about the monsters and their roles in my setting's ecology. I want my players to salivate at the idea of cooking something based on the creature's abilities. Unfortunately, my fellow DMs, unless you've got a lore gremlin player like MC, most players aren't easily incentivized to delve into a D&D setting past the basics of gods, magic, history, politics, and power. And loot. It's always the loot. And that's what I want to enable with today's D&D homebrew. I want to create a subclass that incentivizes players to explore various world-building details by giving mechanical advantages through food. I want a subclass that also challenges DMs to really think about your settings, ecology, and culture centered around food. Because food is the culmination of the environment, the struggle, the conflict, the history, and the culture all distilled on a plate. Hello and thank you for being here and welcome to My Wife is the MC. I'm DMV and you're watching Husbando Homebrew, a show where we take pop culture to pen and paper. So, is everybody comfy at the table? Make sure you add a dash of that like button into your stew and let's get cooking. Before we begin, we would like to thank these magnificent mallers you see on screen. Special thanks to our top supporters, Lycoris QB, The Fudge Sickle, Jonathan Rivera, Birkinator, Grim, Sasquatch, E, Sonic Tate, and the Absolute Mad Lad Cosplay Battle. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. Part 1. Preparing the Kitchen Let's have some appetizers first by going through our design goals. First, have the core features be centered around food, from finding and preserving ingredients to cooking and consuming quality meals. Second, keep the subclass's power level in line with the other specializations via party-wide buffs and a few individual bonuses. Third, keep the mechanics easy to digest, see what I did there, while still allowing both DM and player to express world building and roleplay through mechanics. So the first challenge is actually choosing the class, and we're taking Artificer. The second challenge, which is actually harder, is choosing a name. The official books have the Artillerist, the Armorer, and the Battlesmith, and of course, the Alchemist, which is actually close to what we want to do. Lots of ists. So let's stay on the Artificer's theme and name it the Culinarist. No, that's not a real word, but culinarian just doesn't feel right to me, you know? Now, we can't exactly cook willy-nilly without the right kind of knowledge, and artificers are all about that proficiency. So the first feature, Culinary Arts, grants the cook's utensils and both nature and survival skills. To add a bit more flavor to the feature, you also gain the Prestidigitation Cantrip. I understand that it's a bit stronger compared to the other artificer specializations, but I'm keeping in line with the theme of the subclass. Next are the Culinarist spells. Most of the stuff listed are related to food preparation, like create or destroy water, or locate plants or animals. The latter would be quite useful for finding ingredients, which we'll get to in a bit. And while most of the spells are for thematic purposes, it starts to veer away from utility and more towards CC and damage at higher levels. Now, imagine if you will, you're in the middle of dungeon delving, and a pack of animated armors attack your party. Your group dispatches them with relative ease, but looking at the remains, you realize that there's something more mundane controlling these things. 
a tiny yet amorphous creature with a pair of eye stalks. It's an adorable abalone that uses the metal as its shell. Adorable indeed, and yet you can't help but ask, how does that taste like? Time to harvest some ingredients. Sure, it's easy to just dump the abalone into your pack, but you're likely to lose out on many of the actual parts you can use for cooking. This is where one half of the subclass's core features come in. Culinary Sciences outlines how you can harvest ingredients from your fallen foes and tells you how many pounds of them you can extract based on the creature's size. Harvesting cooking ingredients is one thing, but those ingredients are more likely to spoil, especially with seafood like abalone. Culinary Sciences also grants you the spell Purify Food and Drink, which you can cast as a ritual during a short or long rest to prolong the shelf life of your ingredients. So, you've got your ingredients and your kitchen is ready. Let's actually get cooking in part two. Who let you cook? The second half of the culinarist's core feature is gourmet meal. This feature outlines the actual cooking mechanics, specifically how you expend the ingredients and how many portions a creature needs to gain its benefits. At third level, you can cook beasts, monstrosities, oozes, plants, as well as good berries and rations in case you don't have any cooking ingredients. And typically, this is part of the design where I really get into the mechanical crunch of the features. There's just one problem. I kind of realize that you can do all of these food-based mechanics with the official 5e books. Let me explain. Any player character with cook's utensils can actually do the cooking. And even Xanathar's guide shows a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. There's even a chef feat to further drive that fantasy home. Put that on a brute fighter or a ranger on a dwarf, and you've got Senshi from Dungeon Meshi, essentially. Heck, you can even have an alchemist and flavor the elixirs as food, and there you go, mineral flavor and fiat required. But you know, I, I really went back to my design goals and second-guessed my second-guessing. The core of what the culinarist is trying to achieve is a big world implied by small details, specifically food. The Alchemist has no such mechanic that encourages the DM to really world build around small details. The player isn't even necessarily incentivized to understand the local ecology and what they can offer. Even the chef feat doesn't even say how ingredients can affect the consumer. So I try to cook, as in make some designs based around the ingredients. It was slowly taking shape, but first I had to start with the mechanical steps involved in making a meal. First step in the gourmet meal feature. Pick two ingredients that you'll want to work with. Of course, that abalone won't eat itself, but maybe add in some rations to round out the meal. Then, set aside the number of portions you're going to cook. For a party of four, you make sure to use at least four pounds of the ingredients for your entire party. The cooking process takes about one and a half hours, and no checks are required. After all, you're the expert artificer, and it would sure suck to have to constantly fight and harvest ingredients only to lose them to a bad roll. I know you're better than that. And players, you can help out the flow of these mechanics by reading ahead of time and agreeing with a DM outside of the session on how these features work. Anyway, rant over, let's continue. When you're finally done cooking, you finally get to eat this amazing abalone stir-fry. While the end result is a gourmet meal, the ingredients are the real stars of the show. Each ingredient that you use has a nutritional value, which is a passive buff, and a digest property, which is something you activate for a stronger but short-term benefit. The kind of buffs also depend on the features of the creature where you got the ingredients from. As an example, let's say the abalone has the amorphous and anti-magic susceptibility traits. So when you start cooking, choose which feature you'll want to bestow on the gourmet meal. Now, I know DMs are already thinking of the kind of bookkeeping or session distractions it might cause, so I added a small advice section at the end of the document to help you guys manage this subclass's inventory needs. The list of monster features are based on that massive table in page 280 and 281 of the DMG, giving you over 80 potential ingredients to play around with. Your party takes about half an hour to completely scarf down the warm and flavorful meal. The dungeon's abalone tend to be very prickly around abjuration spells, so thanks to the abalone's anti-magic susceptibility feature, you can now detect the presence of abjuration magics within 30 feet of you, helping you out with magical traps. In a pinch, you can use the Digest property to even cast a modified counter spell against Abjuration spells. From the rations, your party gains a 5-foot boost to walking speed from the nutritional value. When your party rolls initiative, the Digest property potentially adds a 1d4 bonus to the initiative check. Now don't worry about stock and availability issues because these get mitigated at higher levels, which we'll get to in a bit. And to represent the growth in your capabilities, 
The buffs do get stronger when you reach level 9 and level 15 as an artificer. The core features of culinary sciences and gourmet meal mainly cover design goal number 3. But later in this video, I'll be breaking this design goal slightly to offer a different approach, so do stick around. Of course, these are only the core features that you gain at 3rd level. Let's look at the other culinarist features in... Part 3. Chew Your Food Even as the party cook, you'll eventually have to fight alongside your party members. At 5th level, you can use your cook's utensils as combat implements. The culinary combat feature splits apart your cook's utensils into individual components that you can use as a weapon or a shield. And before you ask, tools utensils was broken down based on Xanathar's list of tools. Using your utensils like this also grants several bonuses like extra attack or intelligence based attack rolls or bonus cantrip damage. The best part is that you can instantly gain ingredients if you reduce a target to 0 HP. Refined Cuisine is your 9th level feature, which lets you use new ingredient types from constructs, dragons, giants, and the undead. This also grants a small damage boost when you eat a gourmet meal. And finally, this also lets you cast the Locate Creature spell as a ritual to help you out with finding cooking ingredients. The final subclass feature is Master Chef. And no, you're not gonna make an idiot sandwich unless you have a bard in the party. No, this feature gives you the ability to cook the really weird stuff like aberrations, celestials, elementals, phase, and fiends. This is cool and all, but the main reason this is called Master Chef is because you get to magically create an ingredient by expending a spell slot. This doesn't even count against the number of ingredients you can use in a gourmet meal, effectively adding a third stack of buffs that you can grant to your party. So, I mentioned a while ago that I'd be breaking design goal number 3. And this is really to offer a more streamlined experience with a variant rule. Let's take a look at this variant rule in... Part 4. What about second breakfast? I understand that the core feature of gourmet meal adds quite a layer of complexity and bookkeeping, especially with such a lengthy list of potential traits. But the reason I designed it that way is that it can be more narratively rewarding if there are more nuanced traits for each creature that you can cook. Similarly, the additional variations in party buffs also grant a higher degree of mechanical diversity. To use gaming terms and cooking terms in one, it keeps the experience fresh. But if you want something much simpler, I added a variant rule that lets culinarists cook using creature types instead of creature traits. It's a much more manageable list and a much more streamlined experience. Just take note that it might be less satisfying in terms of the level of detail. In any case, I'd love to know in the comments which cooking style you want to use for your culinarist. And before I forget, you can find the culinarist homebrew in the Ko-Fi link in the description. All features are in the shop page's images, and purchasing it gives you a clean, downloadable PDF and Word file. Also, it goes a long way towards supporting the channel. Now, I get that players might not always prefer a supporting role, and just want something more explosive for their artificer. Well, you're in luck because I happen to have an engineer based on Isaac Clark from Dead Space, which you can check out here. Until then, my wife and I hope you have a great day ahead.